Come on now, people. I've been telling you for almost two years now, you need to have a GNR TV. And now sports are back. Football is back. Now is the perfect time for you to get this if you don't have it already. And if you look on over here, as I've been telling you before, you get all these amazing channels, every single one of them, for $20 a month for two devices. And if you look on up over here, it's written. It's written everything you get with GNR TV. If you want four devices, $40. And there's some cool extras right here. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, get it. What more can I say? What more can I say? It's time to cut the damn cord, stop being ripped off by the dish and cable, and get this lovely thing we call GNR TV. Streaming done right. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Well, this station's mask. I haven't been busy enough. It's, it's been a little rough this year, but I mean, I think that's that's kind of uh, norm. The, the yeah the new norm or at least the twenty it's the twenty twenty norm at least I hope it's not the new norm I hope it doesn't stay this way because uh, yeah. if this uh, if this continues to be the norm into twenty twenty one geez the uh, uh. maybe it'll be better I mean it might be the quote unquote new norm but maybe it'll be a little bit better because we do know what we should be doing it's just a matter of if people will go by that. <laughs> Because there's still there's still people who don't believe in the, the virus, so you know you, you have that, which is just until they get it, <laughs> like oh wait this was this is real, like yeah it's it's real man, <laughs> you don't have to get things to know it's not real, like I don't I don't have to touch fire to know it's hot, I know it's hot, but yes takes me one or two times before you know I figure out that you know my <laughs> <laughs> you know some people are a little hard headed I guess like. Oh, that's hot. Hang on. Let me just slow get- learner. Yeah. That's uh that's, I'm a slow learner. What can I tell you? Oh man. Well, I'm, I mean. Again, like I said, I'm glad to have you guys here and discussing the crumbs. Craig set this interview up, so I guess I gotta give a shout out to Craig, which I worked Craig. had him on here, him and Dave on here for the evil down the street. And I will say I love their work. I like how they kind of even if it's like a similar style story to other stories, they still do it way different than anyone else would. Way different, mm-hmm. put their own twist on. Yeah, it. amazing. Yeah, the evil yeah. down the street was a uh, was a very different type of uh, possession uh, mm-hmm. horror film because it really wasn't. Uh, it didn't have a lot of shock value horror to it. It 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 really remained very subtle mm-hmm. and. Uh, I kind of liked it for that reason because it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a typical possession movie with you know heads spinning and pea soup flying across the room and and uh, you know caked on layers of makeup for for the demonic possession and all of that. Uh, it, it was just it was a lot more subtle and a lot more just kind of psychological uh, horror of watching a loved one turn into somebody that you don't know anymore. You know, put more realism to it in a sense with that, with that, without all the extra stuff. And I, I just enjoyed it. And I like, um, me, I'm more of a slasher type of person. Like that's my favorite type of horror movie, but I'm getting more into the main one thing is because of the podcast too, because my wife loves like paranormal. So we'll watch a lot of that. So I, I'm getting more into like all the other brands of horror. Not that I didn't like them before, but I'm starting to appreciate them a lot more. Yeah. And my favorite type of horror is is the kind of movies that could actually happen mm-hmm. like you know a, a serial killer yeah or uh that type of horror or or uh one of the best horror movies i think i've ever seen was uh called funny games mm-hmm. and it was a uh, it was about a home invasion 
Mm-hmm. It, it was, and and all of the horror was uh, was just the was just the tension and the yeah. the, the the terror that this family goes through when these uh, crazy motherfuckers invade their home and hold them hostage. Uh, and I I think that that's the most terrifying type of story because you know, you can really relate to that. You can really see that happening yeah. IRL, as the kids say. Yeah. I guess you could throw in, um, if you're going to use that movie, I would say uh, yeah. the Strangers. Hmm. The Strangers, you see that? Oh, yeah, Strangers. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and Hush as well. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah um, like uh, The Loved Ones, Australian Horror. Um kidnapping and torture, things like that. There's a lot of good fact-based stuff coming out of Australia, like Wolf Creek as well. Wolf um, Creek, yes. Yeah. Another yeah. great one. I, need and, uh, I love Australian <laughs> horror movies. Uh, the, d- have you ever seen the Baba Duke Australian horror movie? I, I Absolutely. Seen, I've seen that, yeah. Uh, that, to, that, that was really, really, really well done. I mean, and that's... That's one of those. Uh, uh, that's normally that's not the type of horror movie that I'm that I'm attracted to and that mm-hmm. I that I find that compelling. But mm-hmm. that one was done so well uh, with, you know, all the all the really the the jump scares that are so popular now that they're not even scary anymore. Mm-hmm. But uh, you had those in the Babadook where they were used so effectively. Um, and it really got you. And, and I think the reason it really got you is because it made you care about the central characters. It made you care about the mother and her son. Mm. Uh, and it made you, you know, caring about the, 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 the people makes you worry for them. And it mm. puts you in the story with them. And uh, yeah. I think that's, uh, that's the, that's the thing that makes horror movies, uh, succeed or fail is how much you care about the characters that's what makes any movie succeed or fail really but uh, i think especially horror movies you have to sympathize uh you have to you have to be in it with the character you know you guys should hunt down the new release called blind um i saw it on its los angeles premiere i have never connected with or sympathized with the character as much as I did with the female lead in Blind, played by the amazing Sarah French. Um, Blind is a film by Marcel Waltz, and um, all I'm saying is just find it. It was released um, last month, I think, um, on streaming and DVD and whatnot. So it is one of the most brilliant independent horror movies I've seen recently. Also, it's IRL. Um, It can happen to anyone. (laughs) It's not yeah. goobies and goose, ghosties and shit hiding under your bed, you know. Um, just find it and watch it. And Blind. Enjoy. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of, uh, of sympathizing with the characters and, and getting to know the characters, uh, another one that I thought was amazing was The Haunting of Hill House mm-hmm. on Netflix which is like a 10 part series. I didn't think I was going to like it. I thought that, you know, in uh, 10 episodes, it it was going to stop being compelling at some point, because usually series horror series at some point, they usually lose me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I haven't been able to get through an entire season of American horror story. Because I, at, at some point in each season, it just loses me. I stopped caring about the characters at some point. Uh, and I know that you love American Horror Story, uh, uh, Maria. Uh, and a lot of people do. It's apparently, it's, but for whatever reason, it, it's just not my cup of tea. It's not my bag of donuts. Uh, but uh, at some point in, in every season that I've tried to get into, uh, I, I just stopped caring about this, the characters at some point uh, during the season. I think the first season I made it through like eight of 10 episodes and I was just like, you know, I'm not really interested to know how this story ends because I don't care about these people. 
hopefully, mm. and and I will I will use this as a segue. Watch 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 the segue skills. Hopefully, uh, we've accomplished in in the crumbs uh, what we're talking about, and that is making the audience care about the central characters. See how I segued into into our movie. I like that. I like that. What I, what I do want to say about your movie is how I was saying earlier about how Craig and David kind of have similarities to other movies that I've seen. This movie kind of reminds me of, in a small, small way, maybe because of the family and because of what they do, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes. Mm. I, I've heard that comparison a few times, and I think it, it, it's a good one uh, to a point because obviously there's there's not a lot of gore and, and, and shock and yeah. jump scares. And, and all of that and and there's not kids you know screaming and running through the woods in every scene we do have a couple of scenes of kids screaming and running through the woods uh it, but uh it's not that's not what our movie's about uh like the che- che- blah, 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 blah. like the texas chainsaw massacre or or the hills have eyes mm. or wrong turn mm-hmm. uh those type of movies with with uh uh, a family or a clan that is victimizing passers through. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is that it is that kind of genre, but we do something very different with oh, yeah. with the genre, with, or right. the subgenre, I should say. Yeah, you guys, you guys definitely do. I, I like. I, I enjoyed just. I enjoy, I really enjoyed this movie a lot. I watched it with my wife, and she wanted me to tell you guys that she really loved the movie. But I I just enjoyed it because it was just again like I said I say like similar to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but a lot more like a calm way calmer version. And I don't mean this in a a bad way, but like a more intelligent version, just because of what was going on. Like you weren't like a wild. Well, you guys are crazy for what you were doing, but you weren't right. But not you, you weren't. Was about, crazy yeah. Yeah. But we were quite civilized about it. There you uh, we, you guys, we went you guys, about it in a very civilized way and very genteel about, you know, how we, you know, we, we were in, in fact, uh, pretty, um, uh, humane, uh, about how we treated our, even our victims. Uh, nobody, nobody suffered too much. We didn't torture anybody. We just, boom, dispatched them, uh, as quickly as possible and got them on the table or in the refrigerator, uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, post haste. <laughs> so we were, we were pretty humane the way we went about it, but kind of the way, you know, people who, who raise, you know, free range beef cattle uh, are with their animals, uh, you know? Yes. <laughs> I can see, I can see that. I like the way the lab looked. Like it's simple. That set design, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe you you'll remember better, Maria. Was it Alan uh, Albashire that designed the set? Honestly, I'm was, not sure. I'm I, I know it was Alan Al Albashire Albashire. And sorry, Alan, if I'm butchering your name. Um, but he did such a cool uh, set design on mm-hmm. that on that lab. That was my favorite uh, location. Yeah, the la- that was cool. And like, um, I had so I had Chelsea on the podcast a few times, and before the crumbs came out, she you know she could promote it, but she really couldn't say too much. But she was like, right. "I wish I could show you the lab. It looks so cool, but <laughs> there's nothing like I can't do anything. I can't like that's one thing they definitely don't want us to." You just got to see it. And when I seen this movie, I was just like, oh, wow. Yeah. Just, it's so cool. And I like how it's just like at the house, downstairs, you know, downstairs. And the room that it's in is like a dark room, which I like. So it makes, mm-hmm. it gives you that creepy factor. But then you see all the, oh, what the, hell, the beakers and all that other cool stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, this, this is pretty cool. This looks fun. I mean, depending on which, if you're the Crumbs family, that looks fun. If you're on the other end of it. That's, like, <laughs> that's so much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Maria, uh, well, I was going to say, um, I was going to mention how, how pleased I was with how the film turned out uh, at the end after the editing uh, process and all the post was done, because uh, our our process of, of uh, shooting the film was real quick and dirty. 
And I wasn't actually sure that we had everything that we needed, you know, for them to stitch it together and make it, you know, really sing in, uh, in, in the final product. And I saw, I don't know if you ever saw, but I saw a rough cut of the film and uh, after watching that rough cut, I was like, ah, I, "Oops! I don't know if this is going to work." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I want my friends and family to see this because because that first rough cut edit, uh, I was like, Ey. "But they made a few adjustments, mm -hmm. uh, a, a couple really brilliant adjustments, okay. honestly." And and some and also some very obvious adjustments. When I watched that rough cut, I was just like, "There's like, the camera is on this guy for like 15 seconds, just watching him get off his motorcycle and walk into the cabin." It was like you know, 15 yeah. dead seconds, yeah. and and the whole cut was littered with with shots like that, where it was just obvious. We just need to cut this moment out. We don't need to, you know, we're not learning anything about the character by watching him get off his motorcycle. So they, they made a lot of the obvious ones, but then they also made a few like really kind of brilliant adjustments, like putting the uh, home invasion scene. Uh, hey, home invasion, a mm. uh, little callback to what we were talking about earlier, but that home invasion scene at the very top of the movie was originally going to be in the middle of the film somewhere. Right. And Placing it where they did in the in the final edit was pretty brilliant, I thought. Uh, and they made a few other very clever cuts like that. But did you, uh, Maria? Did you have? Uh, were you completely confident about this project from the get go, or or like me, did you have some some misgivings and doubts as to whether it was going to come together? I'm never confident fully about any project because from experience, I know that even the you know, best written, best acted, best shot, best edited thing can still not get out there for some arbitrary reason, you know. Um, so I generally don't make judgments about something until I've seen it. And that's sort of like a catch-22 because I generally don't run to watch my things because I don't like watching myself, especially when I have a big role like I do in The Crumbs, which, and I will confess, I have not yet seen. Oh. I'm at least 15, 20 films behind, okay, in watching my stuff. I've shot things <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago that I have not yet seen, and that is out there. Um, two reasons. I don't like watching myself. I'm too, um, too, I criticize myself too much, you know, and that sort of inhibits the audition I will do tomorrow or the shoot I will do tomorrow sort of thing. Um, and I don't want to be that inhibited because I'm so self-critical. And number two, um, if I have time to watch something, I will always choose to watch something I don't know the story of rather than something that I've actually lived through. Yeah. And I know very, very well. I mean, you yeah, know, I... I Totally, we'll go to screenings, but in this COVID day and age, we don't have screenings anymore. Yeah. You know? So, and even with screenings, I have to be dragged kicking and screaming onto the red carpet for pictures. I generally hide. I don't like that aspect of it. I like the exploration of character, the connection between actors, the craft of it, rather than the glitzy whatever, or even watching yeah. it. I don't know. I'm weird. I'm strange. <laughs> well, in, in, in terms of having a screening, I've noticed a lot of people these days are doing these uh, Facebook watch parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, hey, I'm just going to put this out there for Dave and Craig when you guys see this podcast. Have you ever thought about putting together a Facebook watch party for the film? Invite everybody who was part of it invite everybody who was interested in it and uh I, i'm not sure exactly how facebook watch parties work is it like mystery science 3000 where you can all talk during the film and and make you know your comments while you're watching because that would be kind of fun uh or is it just something where everybody's just watching the same thing at the same time and and you don't really have a discussion about it uh, maybe until the end i don't know with, with, um, with the facebook watch parties 
if they still happen, if they still Facebook didn't take it, <laughs> excuse me, didn't take it down. You can all watch it together and everything, but you can't talk like this. It'd be through typing. But if somebody had like, um, like I use Zoom and then through Zoom, I have a restream thing. Oh, cool. And then there's like uh, stream labs. If you have like something like that to where you have like share your screen and share it on like Facebook and Twitch, mm -hmm. then you can like say if, if the actors were in the Zoom party, for example, sh sharing the movie to the screen and maybe a fan or whoever, maybe the actors and the directors, then you guys can kind of discuss it while the fans can watch it and they can comment. Mm. But I think that'd be a great I, idea. I like the fact that there's like a, a, a there, so there's a text uh, feature on Facebook watch parties where you can make comments in text notes yep. Yep. That, that come up during the, during the screening for yep. other people to see. So that's pretty cool. So that's kind of like a, a little, like a text version of mystery science theater 3000 yep. where you know, you can you can comment on the film as it's as it's playing, uh, and everybody's enjoying. I, I think that would be a fun experience uh, mm -hmm. to throw something like that together for the crumbs uh, in in yeah. lieu of the screening that we never got to have. Hmm. I agree. I think both ways would be cool though, because it and, and we should we should invite all of our podcasters too. Everybody who's been uh, who's been helping us promote the film. Uh, because mm -hmm. you guys are great. I, I really appreciate you guys getting some eyeballs to our little uh, Absolutely. project here. Agreed. I enjoy, I enjoy horror so much. And like, I'll say within the past, maybe I started the show three years this January. So I'll say within the past three, four years when I really learned about indie horror, like as far as like indie horror mm -hmm. and this stuff and, you know, fan films. So I'm like, oh crap, this is awesome. So why, why wouldn't I want to try to help push this out more? Because... It's for the fans, by the fans. That's the way I look at it. It's people who are actually a fan of the genre that are making these movies. And good, or, I mean, good or bad, they're trying. Versus Hollywood throwing out some stuff they just slap together. I'm not saying yeah. that they're involved in the movie aren't always fans, but there's a lot of times where it's just like, okay, well, the majority of these people aren't fans. They're in it for the dollar. These 10 people are fans, but they have no power over the film. So, yeah, I love, yeah. I love indie. I love it. Cool. Yeah. And, and, and we love that, that you guys are out there doing what you do uh, to, to push little independent projects like this. Uh, Cause you know, guys like you uh, are probably increasing our audience, you know, by, by a really significant percentage. I mean, because, you know, films like this, we're going to have a, a, a pretty small, narrow niche audience. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not going to get a, out to a lot of eyeballs unless, you know, uh, that niche audience, people who, who have the attention of the niche audience are yeah. giving us some, some word of mouth. Uh, so it really helps. And uh, I love that you guys do what you do, that you do what you do. And uh, there's been several other podcasters that, that have contacted me for, uh, and and contacting Maria for uh, for interviews, uh, so it it helps us so much. It, it, and uh, yeah, yeah, we appreciate it, man. It I'm, for me, it's fun. And then, like what I what I enjoy about it, besides I get to talk more horror. Who doesn't want to do that? Is I get I'm honored that you guys come on my show because it's not like I mean I know what you're saying. Like we help promote it, but it's like I'm just a I'm just a, I'm just like a a single show like. You know, I, I'm on a network now that I'm starting with some friends, but cool. It's one of these things where it's just like I you never think you'll get the opportunity to talk in the, to talk to these people that are in these movies, big or whether it's the Hollywood ones or the indie ones. I'm just like, this is so cool. People want to come on my show to discuss their movie and promote their movie. Like I never thought that would happen ever. And I'm now I'm just like, I gotta keep doing this because it's I have so much fun doing it, whether it's the movie reviews or the interviews, because you learn so much. You learn so much about other horror fans, actors, actresses, directors, all that stuff, but by just letting them come on and just kind of say what they want and discuss their, pro discuss not only what they do as far as what they did in the movies and promote their movies, but just in general, like what got them into this genre, what got them into this work field and, you know, like what's, what's their goals upon that. And it's cool to see people grow. Like I love watching people grow, whether it's other podcasters, again, actors, act all that stuff. It's cool when someone comes on my show and say the first time they come on my show, they're, they're not the lead role. Second time they come on my show, they're not the lead role. Third and fourth time, like, hey, these past couple moves, I was the lead role. I'm just like, yeah, that's just awesome seeing that growth and seeing how you grow grew personally from somebody who's like, 
I know people come on that are like really shy when they first come on. And then the second and third time they come on, they're just, it's like they're completely, complete opposite, complete 180. I think it's beautiful. And most of it's been indie. Most of it's been indie, which I understand. So that's <laughs> like my door. My door is open for anybody who's a horror fan, but indie's like always first because indie's never been like, no. <laughs> Some people have been like, no, don't give you a reason, which I'm not mad at. You want to come back around and say, you know, my numbers grow. You want to come back around then? Yes, I'll let you come on. But India, but hey, India guys, you guys want to come in? All right, come on. You got to wait. <laughs> <laughs> you got to wait your turn. Because I'm the type of person, I'm I'm a loyal person when it comes to stuff like that. Like, these guys sat down and took your time to come on my show. Yes, you're promoting your movie, but you still took your time to come on my show. So, you know, come on in. I wanted to ask you as an audience member, uh, uh, when you watched the film, uh, did the accent switching throw you at all? Did did you, first of all, did you notice it? Did it bother you? And 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 did you kind of figure it out as you watched it, or did it take you a while to figure out what what the what the accent switching was happening, or why it was happening? It's it's <laughs> now I got to rewatch it again. <laughs> I watched it. <laughs> I was watching it earlier as I was working just to kind of listen to it, give myself a refresher. But now I got to watch it again just to kind of really, really, really pay attention to it. But if I'm not mistaken, which I could be, was it be, it was between guests, right? Switching it up between guests, which of course I understand that. Cause it's like, okay, I got to throw these people off a little bit. And another thing I did love, not just that, well, the accent thing I got to check out again, but what I did love is how, Again, this is why I say it was like a smarter version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If the people had reservations, they had a great meal, they had a nice sleep, and they were on their way. No reservation, just popping up. That's like that person that just comes to your house, that annoying person just comes over uninvited. You know, you get what you get. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how this was. I was like, yes, I like that. I like that a lot. The reason I asked is because the one uh, comment that I'd received from Facebook friends who watched the movie and also uh, a couple of user reviews that I saw on IMDb and Amazon uh, where they, they knocked the film because they thought that the accent switching was just the actors coming out of character. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, that Jeff Hatch guy was the worst with his accent. There were like four or five scenes where he completely dropped his accent. And you just coming out. You had one job, man. Just stay in character. And I'm all like, uh, I guess it didn't. I didn't. It, 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 it didn't they read. Didn't that you guys had different guests for each. Like when you guys did change your accent, you had different guests. It wasn't. It would have been different if it was like, say, if I'm in the movie and, and I'm in every scene, you guys are changing your accents with me in the room every scene but I'm not a part of the whole crumbs thing that would yeah. be different. But when it's like, there's different people in the, yeah. it makes well, the point of it was just to clue the audience in that we weren't really who we said we were. Yeah. We said, we're telling everybody that we're locals. We're just, we're just a family that's lived in this area our entire lives. And we're one of you. Uh, and, but when we're among ourselves, <clears throat> the mask comes off and we speak to each other in our in our original accent and and yeah. you know that's that's when you kind of get clued in that hey wait what's going on with that why are they talking in a british accent now they're talking in an american accent now and then <clears throat> eventually the audience should get clued in that we're only talking in the american accent amongst our guests or strangers right and uh yeah that was one plot point in the movie that uh, seemed to confuse some people. So uh, I was wondering, just as an audience member, if it if it bothered you. It, it doesn't sound like it bothered you. It sounds like you, you just kind of accepted it for what it was, and you kind of understood, okay, this is not actors coming out of character. This is being done for a reason. And you, yeah. you at least got, you, you realized that. I, I and, watched enough horror, good and bad, to know the difference between somebody messing up with an accent in a scene where they're supposed to be and someone just like, okay, this is, this is how it's supposed to be. Mm. And it's just, I think be honest, I think being on this, sh doing this show, being a podcaster kind of makes you open your eyes and ears and close your mouth a little bit more when you're watching these type of movies, because you really have to pay attention, especially when people, 
we know when right. we do our reviews and we do our interviews, it's like, okay, I have to know what's going on. I have to at least kind of know what's going on. At, at the very least, I kind of know what's going on. I can't go in here blind and just expect to do this blind. But, I mean, some people, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, oh, I love, I love, which this is a spoiler, people. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it already. Go watch it now how the sheriff was in on it i knew it from i had that feeling from early in the movie and that again another thing with texas chainsaw master but he wasn't as violent he was kind of mm-hmm. nice, calm but i was just like just, i loved his performance robert crow because uh i mean he was just he was just deadpan you know he was subtle you never you know he he didn't do anything uh in in his delivery to cue the audience that he was in on it. If you got cued in, if you got clued in that, that he was in on it, it's, it's just because you were paying attention to, you know, and, and you kind of know what kind of movie this is. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so if you got clued in, it's just, you're a clever audience member and you're, you know, you're, you're paying attention. Uh, but I liked his performance so much because uh, you would have never guessed by his delivery that, that he was in. There was no wink and a nod. Uh, he was just, you know, straight arrow exactly. all the way up until the last moment of the film. Yeah, exactly. Which was just perfect. It was perfect. But I feel like, again, it's one of those things to where I feel if you're, if I'm not going to say if you're a true horror fan, I hate that. But if you're someone who really, really pays attention, <clears throat> you would have got it. Like you're saying, you would have been kind of clued in on it. Because he was real subtle with everything, but it seemed every time something happened to where the um, <coughs> oh, what is the other cop called? The other Valenti, cop. the 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 PI that was Valenti. Yeah, David's character. Yeah, and that that was our director's character. Yes. Every time he was involved in the scene, the sheriff was there. Every time he was he was there or he was about to be there. I'm just like, this this, this doesn't add yeah. up. Right. This doesn't you know. <laughs> This had, this doesn't add up right at all. Yeah, and, they were kind of a good cop bad cop pairing because yeah. you always saw them together, and it was always the one cop was 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 you know on a mission, and and the other cop was all like, ah, you you the, the, you're you're off on there, you're you're way off, buddy. These people are just fine. They're, they're, they're nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Go move, move along, move along. And the other guys, you know continuously no there's something wrong here there's something going on yeah. uh so uh, it was a kind of a cool uh pairing and and just you saying that uh kind of made me realize that that there was a kind of a good cop bad cop vibe going on between those two because i i, I honestly didn't it didn't uh uh it didn't really enter my consciousness that they were always in the scenes together. And they, and they really were with only a couple exceptions. And Craig's character. The first time I seen this movie, right. I didn't notice him. All right. I noticed him in the woods, but I didn't realize it was him. Like I remember I was talking to, I was talking to my wife. She's like, was that Craig? I was like, I think so, but I'm not hundred percent sure. And the credits going like, yep, that was him. And I'm, I have the movie on mute right now playing in the background. And it's actually the two police officers talking by the uh, the mini mart, and you see the guy, you see Craig laying in front of the mini mart. And I just noticed that small things like that. I love that detail in these type of movies because it's just like some people might be like, "Oh, it's just somebody like," but like, yes, but that's one of the direct, that's one of the producers directors of the film. Yeah, yeah, Craig's character was a little more featured in the in the original the rough cut that I saw, and and it made a. Li- I wish they'd have left him in a little bit more, uh, but. Uh, a bunch, uh, a few of his appearances throughout the film got left on the cutting room floor uh, because they had to trim the movie for time. And so the yeah. the two or three appearances that he still has in the movie, uh, it, it feels like he just kind of comes out of nowhere and, and his character never really pays off. Mm-hmm. His character is never really meant to pay off, but it, he was meant to be more featured in the movie uh, as just sort of this mystery presence this this weird you know hermit living in the woods what's he doing you know is is it's supposed to make the audience go hmm, what's what's up with that guy and, and what significance does he have mm-hmm. and uh i i kind of wanted uh i kind of wanted a, a like a 
uh, I don't know, like a post credit scene that would, that would pay off the, the hermit in the woods character a little bit more, but uh, David and Craig, they just wanted him to, to kind of be in there as uh, just sort of this mystery character, this, this sort of WTF, like, <laughs> It works. What, what is a what's with the homeless dude <laughs> anyway? Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I wish that he'd uh, he'd either have been left in a little bit more, or 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 trimmed out to to where it wasn't a, a you know unask the question kind of thing. Uh, because the the couple appearances that he makes in the film seem to just kind of really make the audience scratch their head on. Was Why did this rando guy just pop into the movie, you know, a couple of times and they never mention who he is? See, uh, I, I liked it in the fact of just because it kind of gave it some realism to me in a sense, because you do see homeless people wherever you go. And I mean, there he could either home. You could say homeless or for horror movies, you could say the town drunk. He could have been either or. Yeah, he was just kind of, I mean, laid out in front of the mini mart and then just in the woods <laughs> like that's. It's two scenes where you would see them in these type of movies. So it's just, I'm like, hey, it works. It, it, for me, it works. I'm not mad at it at all. If we ever get a sequel, uh, I want to see, I want to see that character and I want to, I want to get some backstory on him. That would be cool. That would be cool. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe he's a part of the family and he got kicked out of the family for whatever reason. Who, hey, something that could work. I had a little discussion with, uh, <laughs> I had a little discussion with David, our director, about his character, uh, about Craig's character and, and the fact that he wasn't really ever paid off in the movie and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what what might be done with his character uh, in, in a sequel. And what you just said uh, was was sort of where my thoughts were, were drifting. Like, you know, what if he's mm -hmm. part of the clan, but uh, you know, like maybe a, an outcast from long ago or somebody that we thought was dead. There you go. Greg, make it happen. David, get on it. We need it. We want it. <laughs> this is speaking from a fan's perspective, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they're in post with Demon Hunter right now, so it'll be a while. Yes. Yeah, these guys. Yes. Again, this this movie was a great movie. Though. I, really, I really do feel like if you're a horror fan... You definitely got to check it out. There's not a lot. There's not a lot of blood, guts, and gore and craziness to it, but it's still a great movie, a great story. I think you could tell a better. As much as I love slashers, you could tell a better story when the movie's not too gory and all this other craziness because that's what you're looking for. That's what you're expecting. That's what you want. So you're not yeah. really paying attention to the story, even if the story's good for a slasher. You're not really paying attention either way because you're like, oh wow, look at that guy that just got chopped in half. That was awesome. Versus something like this, where it's more of a slow burn, but. You get so much out of it. You get to see the connection with people. You get to see the connection with the family, and I think that's awesome. I think it work. It just works. It helps. It's for this type of film too. It just perfect. It works. Yeah. And, and you know the the lack of gore uh, was was partly a, a, an artistic choice on on David and Craig's part, mm -hmm. and it was also partly you know budgetary restrictions. We we had a couple of blood gags. Uh, that that just didn't work and we didn't have the time or the resources to reshoot those you know and, and to shoot it and shoot it and shoot it until we got it right uh, so we just had to cut around it and 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 leave the the really couple of, of more gory kills on the cutting room floor unfortunately because i think that it, it would have had a little bit more impact a couple of the kills would have had a little more impact with maybe even just throwing in some cgi blood or something um but mm -hmm. they they decided no you know it kind of works like this it kind of works without all the blood mm -hmm. and it reminds me of uh of the first uh jaws movie steven spielberg's uh you know mm -hmm. near catastrophe uh, it turned out to to be a, a brilliant mistake that they couldn't get the shark to work because they had to cut around it. They had to cut yeah. the shark out most of the movie until the very end, and that built so much more tension in that Ooh. film. Oh yeah, because yeah. their budgetary restrictions 
killed the shark <laughs> before they ever killed the shark at the end. Uh, and it really helped the movie. Mm -hmm. And our little budgetary restrictions actually kind of helped our movie a little bit in the end, because, uh, you know, as you said, and, and as a lot of audience members I've heard have said that they kind of dig the fact that there, it's not such a gore fest. It's not such a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a slasher shock scare thing it's it's more dramatic and it's 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 mm -hmm. it's got more humor and quirk and character development than and and so it, it kind of draw, draws the audience in that way instead of with the cheap yeah uh, yeah you know scares and blood gags and stuff like that and you guys can say that for the sequel more blood and stuff in the sequel okay. yeah hear that Craig? Sequel. Yeah, throw a little bit more blood into it in the in the <laughs> crumbs too. Yeah, have it. Listen here, Dave, Craig, oh, well. talk to you too. So just <laughs> please, fan funded film. Because us fans, we do fund these. We love funding these films. Kickstarter, baby. Boom. Get the bucks right. and deserve. There you go. Get some crap of funding going. Cause you guys do great work so far. I've seen two of your movies. You guys are two for two in my, in my book. And that's tough to say for, um, that's tough to say for anybody, whether it's indie or not being two for mm -hmm. two. And that's true. Yeah. You guys are doing great. You guys are doing great. And you're doing, like I said, you're doing your own type of stories. Yes. You might have similar ideas to other stories, but you're making it your own story. It's not like shot by shot by shot. Like, okay, this is, this is thanks. This is not Thanksgiving. Uh, this is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. No, it's not. It's, it has similar yeah. to it as far as the family and what they do to an, to an extent, and then that's it. And then you guys take it your own way and make it your own story, which I think is just great. And I loved yeah, the night the part now where the guy comes in with the selfie stick and just recording everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it was that. I like that kid. Uh, that, that kid um, oh, gosh darn it. His name is escaping me now. I see him on Facebook a lot these days. Um, Damn it, dude. Sorry. But, if you see this podcast, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going up on your name right now. But uh, I, I really liked that kid on set. Uh, the, the couple, two or three days that those kids were on set, the, the millennials, uh, they were a lot of fun. And I thought his, his performance especially uh, was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to share uh, a bit of screen time with him. And uh, he was cool to work with. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, Marie, uh, you know what? <laughs> My train of thought just jumped its track. Um, let there. me get back to that. <laughs> In there. Yeah, it happens. What this scene too, what I like is the whole, the kids come in there. Yeah. You got the cool kid with the sunglasses. Of course you always have one of those, but, um, the one girl, she's really upset cause there's no internet there. I'm just like, I forgot that there was kids that grew up or that are growing up that have never had no internet or like that yeah. era of no internet. Like I'm old yeah. enough to where I was born in 85. So I'm old enough to know what, like there was a time where nobody had the internet or very, 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 very few people had the internet to where it's just, you didn't miss it. Cause you didn't have, it. you didn't know what it was. And I feel mm -hmm. like, like, for example, when you go to a place like this, the bed and breakfast or something, and you, you go there for the scenery, you go there to get for a getaway, you go there to get away from everything, get away from work and just phones, which was just a freaking is either a regular cell phone or a house phone. There was no extra stuff on there. And I'm like, OK, but nowadays these kids have. Well, I do, too. Now, I'm just saying nowadays kids have all this stuff. So it's like I have my computer right in my hand, my little I, when we go on vacation, we're taking this. Yeah. Bus, and it's like you're going on vacation, pretty much just doing the same damn thing. And I think I like how. <clears throat> The two the families are so different from everybody else because they were like blocked away from that world. And I love how mm -hmm. Victoria was asking, What well, why don't we have the internet? Right. What don't you want me to see? Why don't we have the internet? Because when we'll see yeah. the, what is Wi Fi pretty much? And I just like stuff like that. I thought it was cool. You know what was so much fun for me was building the backstories of those characters. Um uh because uh, and and Maria and I and Chelsea and Anton all got together into a Facebook chat and uh, and shared our uh, brainstormed our our family backstories and we kind of 
took all of our ideas and kind of made them into a cohesive story uh, about, you know, where we came from, how long ago we started this. Yeah. And, uh, and what you just said about Chelsea's character uh, and the internet. And we talked about that, like, you know, why is if, if she's if she's been around this long and she's this old, why is it just now that she's starting to ask these questions? And, you know, we came up with this whole just the fact of the she started taking the serum when she was a young girl. And so it kind of stopped her hormonal. Uh, uh, it stopped that in its tracks. It, it, it just uh, yeah. It remained, or it didn't stop her hormonal, but but she remained hormonally an eighteen-year-old kid for mm. who knows, yeah, a hundred years uh, or more. And, but she's all, and and we've just had this ultra sheltered existence that we've kept her in uh, throughout all of our our all the chapters of our lives in those past yeah. hundred years or whatever since we've been around. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a fun part of, of developing the characters was asking and answering those questions. Uh, and that's another thing that if we ever get a sequel, I would love to be able to flesh some of those things out, maybe introduce yeah. some of that backstory that we came in, into some, some, maybe some, some uh, uh, flashback scenes for the characters in a, in a sequel. So when which, you guys get a sequel, Listen, we're going to put this in the air. When you guys get a sequel? Let's put it in gear. Let's get that Kickstarter crowdfunding started. Uh, this would be my first uh, sequel I've ever done if uh, if it did happen. I've I've never been in a movie uh, in, in a franchise. Of course, I've only been in a handful. Maria, you've got uh, 200 IMDb credits, films that you've been in or so. How many franchises? How many franchises and sequels have you done? I think seven. I think I'm involved in se seven different franchises. Yeah, from things like Killjoy to Percy Jackson to Paranormal Activity to Bunny Man. Um, I forget, <laughs> um, but I did actually sit and count them um, once, and I think the, the quantity I came up with was seven different franchises. Nice. Wow. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at my IMDb page and you look at Maria's IMDb page, you'll see that we have very different career paths as actors. I don't even consider myself a career actor. I consider myself a professional actor, uh, but I'm not a career actor. I'm more of a I'm more of a hobbyist as an actor. I just kind of take the work that comes to me. I don't go out and. Uh, really actively chased down every lead on on a roll uh, i just i i'm too busy with my with my day job making money mm -hmm. you know keeping food keeping the mortgage paid and all of that uh, and i really kind of I, I mean i just enjoy my life too much to to uh i mean i i'm sure you enjoy your life a lot as a as a career actress and I think I would enjoy my life a lot more as a career actor, but I just don't have the, uh, I don't have the ambition that a lot of actors have toward really chasing it as a career. Um, but I know Maria, you've been, you've been an actress for how many years and how many films and how many continents have you shot on? I mean, that's gotta be awesome. That's awesome. I don't, know how many I stopped counting. Um, <laughs> I started performing when I was six, you know, way back in South Africa, way back when in the day. Um, recently, though, um, I've also stopped pursuing. I, I leave that up to my agent now, you know, because I think I've, I've reached where I can with the indie world. I mean, it has to be an exceptional production that I in the indie world that I need to be a part of now because I've just got so many indie films that I, I want to try and grow rather than just stay on the same platform, shall we speak, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, and also COVID shutting down everything and its cat, obviously. 
Um, so yeah. the the environment is not really conducive to hunting down leads in fifty different states and trying to go and shoot there because it that's not a good idea right now. Um, I envy so the stage that you're at. I, I I envy. Job. Yeah. Hmm? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just like working my day job now and no worries and um, just taking the opportunities that either I am offered by my indie friends or that come to me via my agent. Yeah. You know, I don't go out and hunt things down anymore. Yeah. I, I envy the stage that you're at, that, that the work comes looking for you now that you don't have to go looking for the work, uh, which is, well, that's, that's the place we all want to be as actors um and hopefully someday i'll get there maybe one or one of maybe you know the crumbs and the crumbs too will get enough traction that people will start going you know who's that jeff hatch guy we need to give him a call because i got a i got a role i think was right for him i uh, love what he did with the dr benjamin thing and uh crumbs yeah really good and the demon fighter that was pretty good too we're so. all at different stages, you know. I hope someday to actually get more opportunities in network television and studio films. Yeah. I haven't swum in those waters for years, you know. So, but who knows where we'll all end up? I don't know. Just carrying on with the ride. <laughs> that's that's good, though. I mean, it's always great to have goals, and it's just. I feel like if a lot of people see the crumbs, they're going to see your guys' great work as actors and actresses in this film. And that's across the board, too. I feel like everybody did... Do, every part Every part that they did, I feel like it was like the right person for that for that um, role. That's the word I'm looking for. For that role, I feel like everybody had the right role for their character. The way they just portrayed that character. Like, when I see the crumb, the Dr. Crumb, I'm just like, that's you. <laughs> that's you. And... You, you guys did an amazing job with it, and I feel like just the story was great. I love the story. Just it's just a great movie. It's a fun movie, and I'm even gonna say, people, we need more holiday horror. We need a Thanksgiving one. I feel like this fits because you have the family getting together, eating dinner together for like a big, big meal. Mm -hmm. You don't always see them eating, but when you do, you know, doesn't matter what. Yeah. It's Thanksgiving. This is a Thanksgiving. Yeah. Movie. It, it could it could it could work as a as a whole holiday season horror film because you know holidays are all about getting together with the family and friends and 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 that's what this movie has a lot of a lot of family and uh, and it shows like in a strange way it shows love between a family it shows <laughs> I'm just, uh, it can it, twist uh, kind of love but yeah it, it, <laughs> it, yeah what it's showing is like. When I say that, showing like how strong a family's bond is and how yeah. they'll stick together, yeah, In including the adopted member of the family, yeah. Leonard. Yeah, uh, you know we yeah. we've got, you know we've got a whole father son bond uh, that that's happening between him and Doctor Benjamin, and uh, and when there's you know competition and disagreement between the two, you see that family tension and the butting of heads between. You know his character and mine, and uh, that's a strong guy. I will say that I was like, "Oh man, you got yourself." Yeah, it had some strong moments in the in that uh, yeah, in relationship between me and uh, and Leonard's character, uh, who uh, I, I was I was particularly uh, impressed by that young man, by Anton Clark in the role of Leonard. Uh, it's it's like one of his first experiences as an actor. It's his first feature film. And his first, uh, his first, you know, lead or you might say strong supporting uh, role in a feature film. And uh, he really ran with it and did a great job and really, you know, uh, brought that character to life and embodied him. I loved it. I liked working with that kid. Yeah, I thought, again, I think everybody did a really good job. And this is why we need a crumbs too, David and Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Your lips to God's ears. Your lips to David <laughs> Craig's ears too. I'm gonna have to send Craig. Yeah. To say, listen, Craig, we need a Craig. We need a crumbs too. Yep. And, and a three and a four would make a whole franchise out of it. Why not? Maybe you know, part two can kind of. Each one can kind of get deeper in the story. Yeah, we can. We can go back yeah. to the fifties 
we can go back to the to the turn of the century and see what they were doing back then. Well, we could even we could even go into the into the near future. We could go into like you know twenty thirty five and see what they're doing in twenty thirty five. You know, absolutely. Do they still yeah. have that bed and breakfast? Have they been run out of town yet? We don't know, but we'll find out. <laughs> Make it happen, because <laughs> again, this is this is really something that I feel like everybody should definitely go see, and you'll see why there should at least be, at the very least, there should be a sequel. Yeah, and I just Le- Leonard's character. I <laughs> when those four kids leave, he he looks so pissed off. Just staring at the car the whole time. Like that would scare the hell out of me. A big old dude just not wanting you somewhere and you're whatever size you are, there's really nothing you could do about it with no weapons. I, I thought that those four characters were, were kind of a nice head fake to the audience because I think that's the part of the movie where you think, Oh, this is now this is gonna turn into a teenage, you know, teenager, hot right. teenager running through the woods slasher movie and now we're going to get to the you know the screaming and the killing and the running and you know all the stuff that we come to expect from these kind kind of type of movies but it kind of fakes you out because that's not exactly what happens with those kids at the end very true and it's this movie also showed passion as far as the motorcycle guy um you guys saved his life like literally saved his life yeah, I'll say twice at that. I th- that was uh, that kid had a great moment on screen with uh, Maria uh, mm-hmm. in that in that uh, one little like sort of confessional scene yeah. uh, where yeah. he's where he's talking to your character. And uh, I remember you you had a great day on set uh, with his character and working with him. Yep. Yeah. Um- that was the character I enjoyed working with the most because of the backstory I had created, you know, and that caused the most conflict between us, um, Dr. Yeah. Benjamin and Irene as well, which yeah. also made for a very fun, you know, scene in, in the, um, the workshop, the, the lab. Yeah. That was my favorite, my, my favorite bit of screen time. And when I cut my, uh, when I cut my material, my promotional material out for my reel, that's definitely mm-hmm. going to be one of the scenes that I use uh, mm-hmm. for my promotional material for my for my work. And um, yeah, you were definitely my favorite uh, person to work with on set uh, in terms of the core family characters. Uh, and I, uh-huh. I would say that, I would say that Lens, the uh, the 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 kid with the glasses and the selfie stick with the millennial group, he was my favorite of the of our guests that I got to work with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm guessing your favorite guest was, uh, was, was motorcycle man. Oh, Cameron. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I always gravitate towards the heavier emotions. So mm-hmm. that one takes the cake as far as I and Irene are concerned. Absolutely. With Cameron. Yeah. Yeah. What I, what I liked about that scene is how he, you know, he tells his story you know, once he comes back, he tells his story and mm. your character and Chelsea's character are pretty much talking to him. And then like, they pretty much told you and Lenny, like, this isn't going to happen. No. And you guys, you kind of, yeah. they're just like, all right, listen, yeah. I, I better listen to them. <laughs> pretty much, I better just listen. I'm just going to shut up. Yeah. And, and that's what you guys did, which I, but yeah. it, it, it gave that realism to it though. And, and like a family dynamic because, not necessarily with what's going on in this movie, but just in general, that family dynamic, things like that happen, like disagreements happen to where you're just like, all right, I got to yeah. go to the side, just shut up, listen and agree with it. Even if I don't want to, I got to shut up, listen and agree with it. Yeah. One of the, one of the reviews that I read and uh, this, this is probably where, where I kind of, uh, reveal myself to be, to be not quite at the same uh, level of, of the profession is Maria, because like, like you said, Maria, you don't watch a lot of yourself on screen. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, because I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm not a career actor. I'm more of a casual <laughs> actor. Uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I tend to watch what I do on screen because I, I, you know, I, uh, I try to, critique myself my own work so that I can see what worked and what didn't uh, as far as what I did on screen I like to watch myself back 
to see what I'm doing and 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 am I I'm I'm usually my harshest critic. I usually watch my performances back and go, ooh, that wasn't very good. Ooh, that, that that moment didn't quite work. Oh, my accent wasn't quite consistent there. Uh, all of a sudden, I slipped into a northern. What happened there? You know that kind of thing. Uh, but um, yeah. And I and and the other bad habit that I have, if it's a bad habit, I don't know, uh, is that I I like to read the reviews on the movies that I've done. So uh, I've read a bunch of the reviews uh, on the uh, on the crumbs, mm -hmm. and you know it as as a as an actor, it kind of bothered me that some of these reviewers just kind of didn't get it. Uh, I I'm betting that that doesn't really bother you. Uh, at, as much as many films as you've done, you're probably like, yeah, no, they're just going to say what they're going to say, and they're going to just let the the audience have whatever reaction. Well, yeah. But one of the one of the that's absolutely true, and we can't change. Hmm? go ahead. One of the what? Uh, one of the one of the critiques that we got was uh, was a reviewer who thought that you know that the uh, the Cameron scene was just like uh, a gratuitous uh, uh, nod to being PC uh, about, you know, e equality and, and whatnot. And I was like, no, that's, that's not really what it was for. That scene was, was mm -hmm. what that scene was really for was to show Irene's compassion for the kid. It, it wasn't, it wasn't to be right. a nod. To PC culture, uh, but somebody, one of, yeah, the, yeah. one of the reviewers, was like, "Yeah, they had a, they had like an anti-racism message and an anti-homophobia message, and and those didn't really pay off. And you know, don't even know why they decided to do that, except just to give a nod to PC culture and and kind of be woke or whatever. And it's like, no, 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 that wasn't and, what it was for. Yeah. The the racism yeah. stuff was was." because of what was the tension between my character and Anton's and the, the, yeah. the equality, gay equality stuff was because of the, the, the tension between your character and mine, because right. you, yeah. because you saw this kid as a human being, he humanized himself for you because he reminded you of your brother, your late exactly. brother. Yeah. And that yeah. created yeah. Uh, empathy in you and sympathy and it made you see this kid not as a victim and so that created the tension between your character and mine it wasn't just thrown in to be pc people it was there was <laughs> there was storytelling purpose in those characters being who they were see what and, comments and stuff what i've realized is People will leave negative. Not everybody. Some people. Some people will leave like a negative comment as to why, like a detailed negative thing as to why they didn't like something. Others will do it just for attention because they're hoping that someone will like, "Hey, I was a part of this movie. Why didn't you know?" Blah blah blah. blah. Oh yeah, I was just trying to get your attention because as as humans, why we do this to ourselves, I don't know. We gravitate towards the negativity thrown against us versus the positivity. The positivity, just like, oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank. You. But then the negativity are just like. Holy shit! I have to defend myself. And it's like if you ignore those more, a lot of people are trolls. But then there is a lot of people who who are just like really critiquing the movie for what they for what they feel it is for them, which I feel is fair. That's what I do as a podcaster, <clears throat> and I feel that's fair. But I do again. There is those trolls mm -hmm. that just type a bunch of stuff up just for that attention because that's what gets the attention in this world in general. The the negativity, the negative stuff, and the, when that positive comes by, you're just like, oh, cool. But then when that negative comes by, it's just like. A, a month's worth of discussion basically. <laughs> and you got to just ignore them. Yeah. <laughs> when a film is released, um, it's, it's out there. It becomes the property of whoever watches it mm -hmm. as in everyone is free to have their own opinion and to publicize that opinion in any way, which they want. Um, it's everyone's going to interpret everything differently. So, I just, yeah, sure, I read reviews, but I don't usually seek them out to read them, and I never refute them. If someone doesn't understand the accent or the purpose of a scene or what I'm doing or why my character's doing whatever it is, I 
will usually nine nine times out of a hundred not comment or correct or anything like that. Um, the it's you know everyone's open to have their own opinion, and if it's out there, it's 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 out there for that, like any other piece of art. You know, I can walk into I don't know, Los Angeles Museum of Modern Art and go, oh my God, I hate that sculpture. I have no fucking clue what's going on. I, yeah. You know, and that's just as, as valid a criticism of whatever sculpture that is as somebody saying, I hate this movie. Um, I've been in what people have called, oh, this is the worst movie ever. I think I've been in five worst movie ever's, you know, um, Reaction to my character in I Spit on Your Grave Deja Vu ranges from I'm absolutely brilliant to don't ever let her on the screen again sort of things. And you just have to learn to reconcile that. And um, I don't think it's healthy to not to ignore everything, mm -hmm. but I also don't think it's healthy to take anything to heart. You know, just when I'm on set, I, I do my best and I am content when my director says cut prep moving on as in he or she has got what they want it's not up to me to say oh i didn't like that let me do it again it's is my director happy and if they're happy with the performance that's fine just like jeff i will look at myself on screen and go oh i look horrible i'm too fat i didn't get that moment right i should have done that i don't need all that shit in my life because the next time i'm on set i will go with the purity and the truth of the emotional through line of the scene and what what makes my director happy and that's all that's important to me really it is you know and that's I don't know. Maybe I'm strange. No, that's just me. no, it's a, it's it's a very healthy uh, perspective, and I think one one that I can learn from, for sure. Stop arguing with Twitter trolls, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> you just said it. What would I do with my free time if I didn't have Twitter trolls? That's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I never block anyone on social media either. I just unfriend or unfollow. Yeah. I will never block. So I, I block the ones that yeah, are I abusive. I, I block the ones that are abusive. The the ones that just are like you mm -hmm. know, screaming at you in all caps and and multiple cuss words. I don't have time for that. <laughs> block. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with blocking. Yeah, I just don't respond. I get so many messages like, hello, hi, are you there? And I'm like, I oh, no, I'm not here. You know, if someone comes at me with an actual question or a script or a proposition or an offer or whatever, absolutely. But if it's just, hello, then no, go away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anyways. This is a fun episode right here. And again, before uh, we end this, Craig, David, the crumbs too. We we need this. We need this. Make <laughs> it happen. Do it for the fans. Indiegogo or whatever Kickstarter you guys want to use. Have some cool, you know, have some cool things for the fans. Yeah. It's DV, you know, DVDs, Blu-rays, and whatever else, pins, shirts, all kinds of cool stuff. We'll gravitate towards it. We'll get it. We'll buy it. We've been buying the same Hollywood horror movies, the same movies for the past 20 years. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something, yeah. Something new. yeah, it's nice to have something different. And, and they definitely they definitely do different in, in their films. I, I think you're going to like Demon Fighter as well for the same reason, because it's it, it's it's different. It's it's real. I, I mean, it's it's got a, a familiar uh, formula, uh, you know, the horror formula of, of the demonic possession. Uh, you'll see that, that that's there, but they definitely do something different with the characters that, uh, that, that will make that movie stand out as well. I have a strong supporting role in that movie as well. 
can't wait. Which I don't think I, I don't think they would let want me to talk about it. Uh, but I'm. Uh, I already know they won't because before, way before this movie came out, Craig told me about the title. He didn't tell me too. I don't think he told me too much about the movie at all. He was like, <laughs> I can't say anything about it, and he was like, as far as interviews go, he was like, can you please just keep it under wrap? You know. The crumb stuff under wraps interview for I was doing evil down the street at the time. So I was like, yeah, I'll talk about evil down the street. And the people that I had on. So just, they said what they could say about the crumbs, which is pretty much nothing. Just like it's going to be you guys definitely want to look out for it. It'll be out <coughs> last year. So, you know, it'll be out next year. And this, so I get how that goes. So people listen, podcasters, we might get a few sneak peeks and a few things behind the scenes, but not all the time. And Craig's just he just keeps his lips buttoned, which I'm sick of it, Craig. You gotta get. You gotta tell me more. <laughs> gotta open up. Yes. <laughs> That's my two things I want from Craig and David. I want you guys to tell me more, not anybody else, just me. And we want a crumbs party. <laughs> you got. You got to ply them with alcohol. That's 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 the way I get them to open up to me. But I have, but you, to, I have you to get know. to them then. <laughs> you got to get in person with them and buy them a beer. There, hey, COVID, go away, so I can do this. <laughs> But um, I, I do want to thank yeah, you right. for coming on. I had a great, great time. If there's anything you guys want to plug, now's the time you guys can go ahead and plug away. And if there's any links, when you guys get a chance, you can either send it to me on the Facebook Messenger thing or in the group chat or email them to me. And I'm going to try my best to get this episode out. What's today? Saturday, Sunday. I'm going to try to get this episode out by no later than Wednesday. And I'll also send it to you guys when it's out. And um, Great. Thank you. The links and stuff will be like right in the description if you guys send me any links. Uh, okay. Maria, I know you've got you've got to have movies to plug right now, right? You've been working. Um, let me see. There, there were a couple out earlier this year, maybe about five or something like that, which I just need to like remember which ones they are and see where they are. Um, but. It's sort of kind of been a bit quiet. I mean, there was a gap for me. I shot a uh, feature and a short film in February, and then I didn't shoot until October. Mm. So literally everything shut down. So mm. anyway, but yeah, there are a couple that are out there that could possibly need some more amplification, shall we say. And of course, those are those that I cannot talk about. So... <laughs> Here we go with this again. See what I mean? And I even give it the title. So yeah. Well, I can plug uh, watch. You know, for next year, watch for Demon Fighter from uh, CRA Entertainment. And uh, if if you'd like to see more of what I've done in in my acting work, uh, both The Crumbs and a movie I did at, uh, about a year and a half before The Crumbs called Black Mark is also on Amazon Prime. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, all of my m bigger roles in indie films are on Amazon Prime. Uh, the other one is called I'm Still Here, which is a, a very, uh, it's not for everybody. It's a, it's a movie about child sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I play a, a, a pervert. <laughs> And uh, not an unsavory character in that one. And uh, there is a there is a movie. There's a franchise called Mega Shark from the same people who brought you the shark the Sharknado movies, mm -hmm. the Asylum the, the Asylum productions. Uh, they also have a franchise called Mega Shark. I'm in the fourth movie installment of that franchise called Mega Shark versus Colossus, nice. which is. Uh, a giant shark fighting a giant robot, which uh, was fun. And, and, it, it, and it's as good as it sounds. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of those movies that's, that's uh, you know, it, it's, it's mystery science 3000 theater type fodder. It's, it's fun. It, it's fun to watch those kind of movies and, and just uh, uh, rip them uh, for the, you know, the cliches and the yeah. bad acting and the bad <laughs> and the bad CGI and all of that. But uh, it's it's a fun, cool movie. Um, but I, I really always try to turn people on to check me out in uh, Black Mark. 
Uh, it's a 1960s Cold War spy thriller. Uh, I played a title character in that, uh, a guy named Black Mark, uh, who is uh, pretty much the the an- the main antagonist of the movie. Uh, I'm always playing antagonists. I'm always playing bad guys. I'm always playing uh, uh, to type, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm I, I'm kind of proud of that movie because it, on a micro budget. Uh, they got so much production value out of that film. I think that it really stands up well uh, against uh, as a, as a micro budget indie, it holds its own uh, against some of the other cold war spy thrillers of the same era uh, that it tries to emulate uh, with its mm-hmm. little tiny budget and, and bargain priced actors. Uh, but I, I was really proud of it. I think it's a great script. I think it's a good story. It, uh, it definitely takes some paying attention to because the the story gets pretty complex, uh, and there's a lot of little hints and clues that you can miss easily if you're not paying attention. But uh, Black Mark, that that's the one that I that I'm proudest of, uh, aside from the crumbs, of course, uh, that I like to steer people to. Uh, so I'm plugging that one, and uh, you can follow me uh, at my Facebook page, Jeff Hatch Actor. Uh, and uh, the Hatchinator at the Hatchinator on Twitter. Ah, oh, the Hatchinator. Now, next time I have you on, I'm just going to refer to you as the Hatchinator. I have to. <laughs> I used to get that. That that's all. The, uh, a few places that I've been, people uh, people found out that was my my handle <laughs> on Twitter, my nickname uh, in college, and they started calling me the Hatchinator, and that, that kind of stuck. So. I've, Hey, it worked. I've used it as my I've used it as my Twitter handle and uh, my my Instagram handle and all of that kind of stuff. It works. But yeah, again, thank you guys both for coming on. Had a great, great thank time. you for having us. Yeah. We gotta do this again when especially for the crumbs too that Craig and David are gonna make at our demands. <laughs> But yeah, like I said, though, just when you guys get a chance, no rush, of course, just send me your links. And once this episode comes out, I'll make sure that the links that you guys, just, you know, the movies you discussed, and I'll have the links down below. And to all the listeners out there, everybody who's watching this episode when it comes out, watch The Crumbs on Amazon Prime. <clears throat> it's yeah. a great movie. You're going to have a good time with it. And it's it's really one of those movies to where you can watch it with your significant other because... You guys that know my show, you know I watch a lot of crazy shit that your guys, I'll say most of your wives won't watch. Most of our wives won't watch. My wife just leaves the room. This isn't one of those, I promise. This, this, I might, I might have hurt some relationships or started some arguments with, with some of the movie selections, but yeah. this will mend that. This will fix that. So definitely go and watch this movie. Not exactly a family film, but maybe a date night film. Yeah. Date yeah. night. But with the wife, you know, the kids are asleep. Have some dinner and watch this movie, and you're gonna you're really gonna enjoy it. I really do feel that way. Yeah, but again, hey man, thanks, Aaron. This has been a great. Uh, yeah. It's been a great time. Thank you guys for coming on, and like you're I welcome. said, we'll do this again. Enjoy the rest. Oh, sure. of the eve- I don't know which side of the world you got, California or what. So enjoy the rest of your evening or afternoon, <laughs> and we'll <laughs> do. You. We'll Thank definitely you. talk soon. We'll definitely talk soon. Awesome. awesome. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.